Welcome Junior Tuckies, my name is Mrs. Ramla. This video is on the section evolution on natural selection and this is a theory video. Right, now let's look at terminology that one needs to know. And the first one is a hypothesis. And as you can see, I put the important words in pink. A hypothesis is a statement that can be proved true or false after an experiment. It's also known as a testable guess and it's also known as a prediction. So, now this before you do write a theory, one must have an hypothesis and that hypothesis will have to be proved true or false after the experiment. Now, a theory is a set of logical ideas that has been verified by many scientists. Okay, that is the easiest explanation. That's the one I've seen a lot in many past papers. Now, let's look at evolution. The theory of evolution states that all organisms we see today arose from organisms that existed in the past. They may look different because things change over long periods of time. Yes. Biological evolution is a special type of evolution that refers to changes that living organisms have undergone, have undergone over long periods of time. This means that all present-day life forms have descended from and are related to those that lived in the past. Yes, our ancestors. All present-day life forms may look different from those that they are descended from because they have become modified from one generation to another. The theory of evolution is also known as descent with modification. So as the organism was changing over time, the organism was becoming better. Right, a fossil record. A paleontologist is a scientist who studies the fossil record and he discovers new fossils. Now, what are some of the uses of fossils? Fossils help us explain how animals and plants have changed over time. They can also help us find out the age of rock layers. They can also help us find out the climate and environment uh, at the time the fossils were formed or were formed, yes, or lived. They can also help us with finding fossil fuels. Now, how do we find out the age of a fossil? That's known as fossil dating. Now, methods of fossil dating. We use relative dating. And we compare the age of a new fossil in relation to an index fossil. Now, here I've put the trilobite. You learn this in grade 10. A trilobite is a fossil that has been found in a certain rock layer and it has been found in the same rock layer throughout the world. So we know exactly, we have a good idea of how old the fossil is. So here's the index fossil. If a new fossil is found in this rock layer, we know that this rock layer had to be laid down first. So this rock layer is older. The new fossil, we will say it's younger because this rock layer is laid down afterwards. So we say the new fossil is younger in compared to the trilobite. If a new fossil is found here in this rock layer, we know this rock layer had to be laid down first before the index fossil, so we say this one is older. So we compare the age in relation to an index fossil and we look at the rock layers. Right, another method is radiometric dating or carbon dating. We call it carbon dating because mostly carbon isotopes are used because Carbon isotopes are found, or a carbon is found in most living organisms. Now, scientists will look at the isotope found in the living organism and the isotope found in the living in the fossil. Now, remember, isotopes are unstable. Isotopes constantly change from one form to another, and scientists have a very good idea of how long it takes for one isotope to change into another isotope, and it's usually in half lives or yeah, half lives, which you may have learned in grade ten science. But this is just an easy explanation for those of you who don't do science. Right, let's look at biogeography. Biogeography is also evidence for evolution. Biogeography is the study of geographical distribution of living organisms on Earth. You will understand this more when we talk about speciation, which I've done in another video. Right, now let's look at genetics. Now, molecular biology, where you're looking at the DNA molecule. If you look at all species, all living organisms have the same four nitrogenous bases. They have the same mRNA, tRNA, rRNA. They have the same 20 amino acids. They have the same for, um, order of cellular respiration, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. This proves that all these organisms, all these species have a common ancestor. Also, we must learn with genetics that genotypes influence the phenotypes. And we know that genotypes are passed on into offspring and then from generations to generation. Right, genomics, the Human Genome Project. 
this was published in the year 2000. So they looked at organisms and they looked at their nitrogenous bases or their nucleotide sequence. And if you look at humans and chimps, you can see humans and chimps share 98.3% of their nucleotides. This proves that humans and chimps have a common ancestor. Right. Very important. You must know this before you go into your exam. Continuous and discontinuous variation. Now, continuous variation is based on a range of different phenotypes for a particular characteristic, meaning that its inheritance is determined on many genes, polygenic inheritance. And the genes, the other genes that could, that could influence this inheritance is your diet, your social factors, and your immune system and your health. So it's based on a range of different phenotypes and it's determined by polygenic inheritance. The graph that we use to explain continuous variation is a bell-shaped curve graph. Okay. Now, discontinuous variation, there's no range in the different phenotypes. Right. There's no polygenic inheritance. You either have the allele or not. So if you look at the graph that you have here, this graph, you can see there's the bell-shaped curve graph that I draw. So this will be continuous variation. This here is a bar graph. This will be discontinuous variation, like in the example is blood groups. You either have the blood group A allele or not. Height is an example of continuous variation. So here's my table here and you can see all the examples and you can read that on your own. Right. Now, let's look at our famous scientist, Lamarckism. We know Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. He is the one who came up with his first theory and this was in the 1700s. It was quite amazing. His first law is the law of use and disuse. He said the more organi um, organisms use organs, the bigger and stronger and more developed they become. If they disuse the organ, organis um, sorry, the organ becomes smaller and it's totally can disappear. Then he says the modifications are brought about by the law of use and disuse. So this characteristic then becomes acquired and you can pass on this characteristic on to your offspring. It's like the example we have here, rugby players. A father who trained as a rugby player, he has strong muscles, right? And because he trained a lot, he used his muscles, the muscle became bigger, and he'll pass on these muscles to his children, okay? Now, these are the two laws. How are you going to be tested this? You will be asked to apply the laws to examples, so practice past papers. Now, let's look at why Lamarck's theory is not accepted. Unfortunately, organisms don't just evolve because they want to organisms um, become suited to the environment and acquired characteristics are not passed on to offspring but rather genetic characteristics are passed on. Right, Darwinism, the father of evolution. So a famous scientist and he came up with a theory of natural selection. Now he went on a trip uh, on the HMS Beagle, a five-year voyage or five-year trip and he went to the Galapagos Islands. And after traveling and going to the Galapagos Islands, he came up with the theory of natural selection. So what is natural selection? When the environment chooses organisms that are best suited to the environment, so they have the favorable characteristics, they will survive and reproduce. And those that are not suited to the environment, they have the unfavorable characteristic, they will die out. Now, this is Darwin's theory of natural selection. You need to know this very well. Plants and animals generally produce a large number of offspring. There is a great deal of variation amongst the offspring. Some have favorable characteristics, some do not. When there is a change in the environmental conditions or if there is competition for resources, then organisms with characteristics which make them more suited survive. Organisms with favor unfavorable characteristics will make them less suited, they will die. The organisms that survive or reproduce and pass on their allele. But remember, we must change the word allele now to factor. So, let me try and write that neatly. So we must change it to factor. Let me write the word neatly here. Factor. They will pass on the factor to the favor of the fa for the favorable characteristics to the offspring, and then from generation to generation until the entire population has the favorable characteristic. You need to know this very, very well. And then again, you must be able to apply this. Now, let's look at punctuated equilibrium. Punctuated equilibrium is the speed at which evolution takes place. 
Now we're looking at Darwinism. Darwinism is also known as gradualism. Darwin says there are small gradual changes that take place in organisms over a long period of time. And he used his evidence at look at transitional fossils at over time. That was his evidence. In 1972, Niles Elridge and Stephen Jay Gould, they said the species remains outwardly the same for long periods of time. That's known as an equilibrium. And this alternates with short periods of time where there's rapid changes through natural selection. And they used the absence of transitional fossils, whereas Darwin used presence of transitional fossils, they used the absence of transitional fossils. But punctuated equilibrium is a new theory. It's something new and it's still being investigated. Here I have different diagrams and graphs of gradualism versus punctuated equilibrium. Make sure you identify them and you'll be able to know them in your exams. Right. Thank you for joining me and watching this video on natural selection, the important things you need to know on natural, natural selection in evolution. Join me and watch all my other videos as well.